ancillary groups. There was a lot of flows of right. money. Uh, Chelsea, in a sense, wanted to push him aside uh, and try to, uh, you know, I don't know if clean up the foundation or bring her own right. people in to do the same thing. But fascinating insight into kind of the, uh, the game of throw. Folks, welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 2919 East Broadway. This is a special edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. Coming to you live on Power Talk, please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app and stream all of our live local shows, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. We can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today. Without further ado... I want to bring in uh, really a decorated drummer, a guy who uh, learned his rudiments uh, on the streets, banging on pots and pans with Latinos in San Pedro, California. Uh, he has continued on in a multitude of different directions. Most recently, his new album, Matt Chamberlain and Brian Haas, Prometheus Ri uh, Risen. Matt Chamberlain, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Hey, Jake, thanks. How you doing, man? Good. We just finished up our six-day run uh, last night, so I'm kind of in uh, healing mode. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's like a state. Of, that's like a healing bliss. I mean, can you talk about the physical demands on the bandstand when you're playing melodic improvisation and essentially not basically stream of consciousness and using all the all the all your facility. Yeah, well, with with uh, with Brian, we uh, you know the way we did the record was just completely improvisational, but not just you know playing over a, a bass line and just blowing. We we thought it'd be fun to do more compositional improv. So you know if you hit upon like an A section and then a B section, you kind of you, you just look at each other and you're like, let's go back to the A section. And, you know, you just kind of uh, spontaneous composition style kind of improv and then within that we we you know have our moments of of throwing down and uh you know so so that that was kind of the intent with doing that and um and then of course i'm, I'm incorporating all the electronic stuff too like doing live looping i have a mic by the drum kit where i can uh, loop myself or i can loop brian too I, i've been doing that this week we we kind of discovered that we could do that um so like he might play a figure like a bass line and i can just loop it and then there's a bass line and then we can just you know go from there I'm playing on top of that as the basis of stuff and I'm not, uh, you know i mean i i you talked about being in a healing mode i just when i'm looking i'm just curious about um you know, because I, I mean, like, I'm, I'm totally obsessed now. Uh, I'm, I'm like, I've connected to his, uh, his family because his handlers won't uh, even acknowledge me. But I'm obsessed with uh, Billy Kreutzman from the Dead, and um, uh -huh. you know, just the amount, like, three hours four, or four hours of, of just playing. I'm just curious about how. I guess more, maybe better. The, uh, the better question is, how do you? Uh, like prepare yourself for the for the physical demands of being on the bandstand on the kit not playing i mean when you play on un, unstructured very free music oh man you just do it you know you just jump in just jump into the fire <laughs> just that's the only way really to do it i mean anything you try to prepare for for improvisation is kind of uh, the exact opposite of improvisation. So yeah, no, I guess what I mean, I mean is what I mean is like, yeah. do, do you are you are you like lifting lots of weights? Do you do? do you oh, stay, oh no no no! Yeah, I'm, just, I'm talking about like I'm talking like the physical. I'm lifting lots of drum cases. <laughs> yeah. I'm, lifting, I'm lifting drum cases out of the van, onto the onto the stage, and then off the stage. Right. So you got no, you're, you're, doing, you're 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 your own roadie. All right. Well, that's great. Yeah. All right. That's great. I mean, I really dig. Um, when you talk about the looping part of it, uh, is that stuff that you um, upload into a computer and just have to hit a key, or how did during the live setting? How do you incorporate the the looping? It's uh, I'm just using this uh, piece of gear that I've had forever. It was I think they stopped making it back in the '90s, but it uh, it's just called a, a Gibson Digital Echoplex, and it just you hit a button on it that says record and then you hit the button again and it starts looping. And, um, 
you know, you just plug a mic into it. I have a mixer um, attached to it so I can control the levels of it. And then uh, once it gets looping, then I have on the mixer, I have effects. So I can kind of be like a DJ to my own loop. You know, I can process it with delays, like dub it out. and uh, You know, so I can stop playing drums and just turn into, you know, uh, you know Lee Scratch Perry. <laughs> dude i had the funniest fun. conversation with that dude one time because uh uh larry mcdonald i don't know his, the percussionist do you know larry i don't yeah well, he played with gil scott and you know bob marley but you know he played with lee scratch oh, wow. lee 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 has some has the thickest accent in the world it, i'd have to do an interview with him in person because over the phone it was absolutely impossible but you're you're a scratch man um, I, I mean, this just it's just such an honor to connect with you, man. I, 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 there's a couple of cats I need to talk to you about. Um, one guy that seems to fly below the radar, but, I mean, serious gravitas, uh, that you had a chance to study with the cat Chuck Flores. Um, can you talk oh, about yeah. Yeah, I mean, this dude was at the forefront of West Coast bop music. And the guy could also play free. I just wanted you to talk about, ultimately, those cats, their school was the bandstand. There wasn't academia. You weren't creating vocabulary within the four walls of academia. These guys were stretching ears all over the place and was led by guys like Shelly Mann. But then here, how did you connect with Flores? And then if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, his style of education. If you give a talk about a specific teaching moment with him, uh, that was not, you know, that was not in your, what we think of today as uh, music education. Right. Well, I, I came to Chuck through, uh, I, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I was lucky to have all these cats just living in the area. And I didn't know anything like that. Um, when I contacted him, I was uh, taking drum lessons with David Garibaldi from Tower Power, Um and he said I should contact Chuck because Chuck is the master at uh, teaching independence and uh, just kind of getting around the drum kit in a fluid way. And uh, it's like, and uh, I went to his house, and he didn't have a drum kit set up. He had these practice pad drum kits set up in one of his rooms. And it's all about just being uh, fluid with your limbs and being able to play anything in any combination. And so he had me go through this book called Bass Drum Control, and he had his uh, own system of, of doing that book. And, I mean, it was very... I started playing drums when I studied with him, so, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't know anything. I, I, you know, I was just trying to absorb. I was trying to be a sponge and... Uh, and you know, I, and I just learned about him after we, you know, after I studied with him. I didn't know anything about West Coast jazz. You know, I I grew up listening to Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin. That's and a little, no, and all my this friends. is the greatest part. Of, I I I love talking uh, to my to my peers because you guys came at this stuff completely, you know, from the back door or whatever you want to say. Yeah, it was like a yeah, it was backwards. You know, I I. <laughs> I'm still learning about all this stuff. I mean, uh, it's incredible that that guy was a legend, and he was. I think he's still around. Right? He's still. I, you know, I'll tell you, I, 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 my gut tells me that he is still. I mean, he was born in '35. I got to get to him and interview him. I just, I mean, when you start throwing out names like Carmen McRae, Art Pepper, Al Cohen's, Bud Shank, uh, I, I just, you know, to me. Chamberlain, I want you to talk a little bit, go, dig a little bit deeper when you talk. First of all, Garibaldi, that's going to be a whole separate discussion because that dude, I mean, one of my one of my closest confidants on this tour, I've been, done like three interviews with that cat. And uh, yeah. I I guess he, that that he was living in L.A. at that time or you just happened to connect with. I thought he was down in L.A. in like the mid 80s. That's what studying with him. He he had moved out there to uh, do for a bit and uh i remember he had a place out in canoga park you know i was probably like 14 or something it was hilarious because my first lesson with him uh i didn't even have a drum set <laughs> i just i just found his number through the musicians union absolutely that's the right way to go yeah <laughs> i was like 
I love your drumming. I want to learn how to play drum kit. And I, at that point, I'd only been working on my hands, just learning uh, rudiments and stuff. And he just, he he was like probably the biggest influence on me just because he taught me how to play a backbeat and how to actually get the sound out of the drums and how to, um, you know, his whole concept was taking the old, you know, soul R&B drummers and kind of modernizing it in a way. And uh, so he, he taught me all the, you know, inside groove stuff, you know, like the, the sound levels of accented and unaccented notes and um, taking rudiments and spreading them out on the kit and making grooves out of them. And I mean, it, it just was really, really eye opening. I had no idea, you know, I would have just been a basher rock drummer if I hadn't encountered him. He, he really gave me a lot to work with and I still work. I mean, the stuff he gave me is like a lifetime of work. You, you can work on that stuff forever. You know, just did you, all the permutations. Well, no, I mean, did you find yourself, I, I remember in my first interview with him, he talked about, you know, because Oakland was such a hotbed of activity. This is, you know, even when you were just a baby, basically, early 70s or, you know, you know, late 60s. And, you mm -hmm. know, he would just get together with other cats like Harvey Hughes and other great drummers. And they would just kind of work out grooves together, show each other stuff. I mean, can you talk about a lesson? Because at a certain point, again, you were just starting. But I just get to the point where I'm talking to Harvey Mason and he's talking about lessons with Alan Dawson. And, you know, Dawson's like basically wow. like, I can't, I can't teach you anything. So what they wound up doing was like, you know, Alan would get on the vibes and Harvey would play drums and they just, you know, listen to each other and play games. I mean, did it get to that point? Yeah. Um, I, I, but you were really just a, uh, it was just a, you were just a, a kind of an infant at that point. I mean, did, yeah, I was just a very, very rudimentary novice drummer just trying to take it all in and um i mean i'd i don't you know i just barely had a drum kit so you know i pieced one together from drums at my at my um school they let me borrow stuff and um <clears throat> and so you know at least i had a kick snare and a hi-hat so i could work on those exercises he gave me but it was just all that it was just all like very just just simple concepts of you know having your hands you know play a groove and then your foot would read just random rhythm rhythms out of like uh, Ted Reed's syncopation book or, uh, you know, just the, there were, it, it was just about getting independence together. Um, being able to hear something, uh, and, and play it with your foot against something with your hands. So right. Like if some, if you know, if a bass player was playing some syncopated groove, I could keep the top part of my kit playing some kind of thing and then the kick drum could follow the bass player like that was kind of a concept and uh you know i wish i had more time to dive in with him but uh you know i ended up going to college and i had to leave town so i wasn't able to study with him anymore and he he, he left town i think like in the early 90s or maybe late 80s he, he split he, he went back to he, oakland he didn't he didn't he didn't like the vibe down there at all he was in a uh, uh, it's escaping me now. He, there, he had a classic live band that he was in. Uh, it was one of the only bands that played uh, in in the L.A. area. I'm gonna have to have to go back and look at my notes. I mean, you talk about independence on the drum kit. I mean, for anybody listening worldwide here on Power Talk, just in general, younger cats, what does that mean exactly? I mean, in, in terms of don't, is it about uh, not just going? into one part of the drum kit but realizing that there's a whole different sonic palette within within everything especially when he sent you to flores i mean when you talk about learning independence if you could if you could talk break that down a little bit more i'd appreciate that yeah well independence basically means on the, on the drum kit is you know you got your four limbs and uh you know there's a lot of different ways to uh to, to create a, a, a groove with your limbs. And, you know, there's the, uh, um, you know, like in jazz, for instance, you know, you have your, like the most basic jazz beat is your hi-hats playing two and four, and the ride cymbals are going, ding, 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 ding. and then the bass drum and the snare drum are just interacting around that. So like an exercise for just playing, you know, ding, 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 would be to read, uh, just you know, like they, they, there are a bunch of books out there where it's just random rhythms, and you just kind of read them down against your left foot playing two and four, and your right cymbal 
and you know your right hand playing doom, 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 doom. so you try to keep that consistent while doing all the permutations with your other limbs so that that's independence so like it means uh, having your limbs have having you know, like there's other exercises where three of your limbs will play a certain pattern and then the one free limb will improvise over it so that that's what independence is basically it's uh being able to create a, a a situation where one of your limbs or two of your limbs are free to interact with the music while the other limbs are just keeping a groove. That's that's the most basic explanation of it. Um, Talking with yeah. Matt Chamberlain here on the Jake Feinberg show. He's he's recovering from a from a six <laughs> six six night gig in the Pacific Northwest on the mend and having to deal with my sort of esoteric non musician questions. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you really, well, I mean, the, the, yeah, I, I just did. Can you, can you point back to this? I'm mean, just reading here off, uh, the Wikipedia page, but you know, you were born in San Pedro growing up, uh, air drumming and using pots and pans. I mean, here's the thing that, that you know, these cats in the late sixties that came to the Bay area, uh, from other parts of the country, th- there was a, there was a group called the gravity adjusters expansion band. And it was like Lee Charlton and, you know, and a lot of Tom Donlinger. And these guys were like badass jazz players. But then they, they were like into making percussive instruments. And eventually one of the guys, Richard Waters, created the Waterphone. They made two oh, wow. albums and they're both like $600 each. But this is the most like sonically, like your ears will just grow from this stuff. And there's something about the indigenous nature of just rhythm and the idea that you had to put your own drum set together and that, you know you were making you were creating sound i mean can you can you say that you were creating sound from when you were just a kid like a and 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 how you and if that got you off at all because you know you, you can get any type of drum kit now but you know right, right. it's like the, it's like to me it's like the 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 you know the modified trap sets or the or the or the inventions or the creations that to me is like the expansion and i i look at your your stuff you're doing with Haas, and it's like, this is what you guys are trying to channel anyway. Right. Well, you know, first of all, the Wikipedia page, I don't know who wrote that, but, you know, I, you know, I guess I did play Pots and Pans, maybe. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> okay, well, we might I need to, to change. Yeah. Go ahead. It's weird. I try to change the Wikipedia page. If anybody knows how to change your some a Wikipedia page, somebody wrote about you, and let me know. Every time I try to change it, the person comes in and, and is like, I don't. I can't confirm that you're really who you say you are. I, so, I mean, what do you need to give a but, social security uh, number? I. I mean, to me, it's like this is, <laughs> this is like I've done that too, and they they're very. They're, this is a bit. This is a bit fascist. I must say the the Wikipedia stuff. It's weird. It is. Yeah, but, it's, uh, it's bizarre. There's there's nobody to contact. There's nobody to. <laughs> but but anyways, yeah. I, a, a lot of what I did growing up was out of the fact that my family just didn't have the money to buy me a drum kit. I just. You know, I would just grab shit at the high school or the junior high. You know, I'd stick a, a symbol on the floor, and and you know, if you're on like one of those high school floors or you know those hard linoleum floors, you can you can put your foot on it and close it down like a hi hat, and then open it up by, by lifting your foot off it and get like a hi hat thing. And then we just set up a bunch of toms in a room and just jam. It was so much fun. You know, I didn't have. They, they didn't even have a drum kit at our at our school, so I just would set up all the just everything. <laughs> I <laughs> love. Really I love. Teacher, I mean, what, I mean, he, he would just let me. Uh, he he like during lunch break, he'd just say, "Go at it, Matt." You know, there's a room. Just let me go nuts, and I don't even know what I was doing. I just would go in there and just freak out. It was fun. Um, but uh, then later, I you know we, I was able to you know save up a little bit of money from, you know, odd jobs here and there. But, you know, drums are expensive, man. That was a big deal, you know, buying a drum kit. At least back then, you know. I remember I got some money to buy a ride cymbal, so I went out to Guitar Center in Hollywood. And it was a big deal. I was like, man, I'm going to be dropping, like, you know, $250 on this cymbal, just one cymbal, you know. Right. And uh, and uh, so I played the hell out of it. The funny <laughs> thing is, is when I went there, when, <laughs> when I went to the Guitar Center, I saw it when I was walking in. I, I saw this Bentley parked out front, and I looked in there, and it was Rick James. I was like, "Damn!" Uh, yeah, he didn't. I'm he, in Hollywood. He, yeah, well, you're in Hollywood. He didn't. That that wasn't that wouldn't be a lot of money for Rick James. But no, I mean, this is like such a. 
<laughs> this is like such a fascinating situation. Did you have a school that had like any kind of band program, or was it? How did yeah, it was like marching band. It was marching band. They didn't have like a jazz band. It was just like marching band. So you know, San Pedro High School and and junior high was just. Uh, and then they phased the music program out like right after I graduated. So I mean, it was. I was lucky that there was even that. You know. What do you think, if anything, I mean, did you get a chance to play with, uh, like, I mean, did you learn, you know, sort of the, were, were there, like, a lot of Afro-Cuban cats playing, like, congas? Like, I'm just saying, like, not even in the school itself, but, I mean, the fact that you were really just scrapping your way towards just, just trying to make sound. I mean, did you wind up doing it in isolation, or were there cats that you, you were able to play with, maybe even developed a, unknowingly, like, kind of like, a, uh, got used to playing clave music or something like that? No, there was none of that. That's for sure. I didn't. I didn't experience any of that in San Pedro. I mean, San Pedro is, uh, you know, it's the port of Los Angeles, so it's a lot of blue collar people. There, there's a huge Croatian population there as well as Hispanic, but um, it's not like you know, uh, it's not Cuban or anything. It's just kind of, you know, it's a beach town in Los Angeles. So all my buddies I was growing up with, you know, we, you know, we we were all into the music of the time you know we were into like you know the Minutemen were our local band so you know we could go to this all ages club and go see all these punk rock shows and um i didn't know what was going on with that music i just knew i could get in and meet girls so you know i'd go to, to those all ages clubs and, and check it out and but i you know when when i would play it was just practicing my ass off and listening to records and uh you know i had a list of records to check out that i got from Garibaldi, so like you know, I I go out and buy like Nefertiti by Miles Davis, and I was just like, what is going on? I, you know, I had no idea. It just blew my mind. I still listen to it. I don't even know what's going on, but uh, just incredible. It, um, is it about? Can I ask you a question? I'm not. I'm not sure who the is that. Tony yeah. and Ron is the rhythm section on that. Yeah, it was Tony Williams. I mean, that's like one of his. I mean, just the song Nefertiti is like his. I mean, if you just listen to that, you kind of get the full Tony Williams experience from that era, you know, <laughs> it's insane. Well, there, actually, I want to read you a quote that, and, and see, and get your opinion on it. Cause it, it kind of speaks to, uh, it says, uh, this is from Tom Coster. I don't know if you ever played with Tommy. He's a keyboardist with Santana was anyway, among other things. And he yeah. said, uh, when Tony Williams and Ron Carter came into playing with Miles, they no longer just played straight ahead, ding, 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 da, uh, dotted eighth note to the 16th note swing. Rather, they broke the time up. That just messed me up. I thought it was so beautiful. They're breaking up the time, and there's freedom. And then all of a sudden, on My Funny Valentine, they start going into time. It lifted my entire being. That whole concept of no longer just playing hard bop, but breaking up the time and everybody having a space to create. All of a sudden, as the choruses went by, everybody started to swing the tune. After that, it became a whole new way of rhythm sections playing. I think it was the beginning of changing the way jazz was played. And not only do I want you to riff on that, but I also want you to talk about if any of that stuff can be uh, you know, merged with what you are doing with Brian Haas uh, in your collaboration. Oh, definitely. Can you talk about that? I just going in, leave, breaking up time and going into time. Just I want Chamberlain riffing on that. Okay. Well, um, yeah. What I think what he was saying about Tony was, you know, up until that point, it was just drummers playing time and just kind of interjecting. And Tony was one of the first guys I ever heard that was, he was actually comping. He he became like his role as a drummer was was morphing into like, you know, he was, he turned into the piano player or, <laughs> he, you know, like this, like yeah. he would take on the role of just interjecting rhythms or, or phrases or little motifs as well as playing time. And he would stretch the time in a way that wasn't just a function of playing the drum kit. You know, it was almost, uh, he was, he, it was like impressionistic, you know, he was like, uh, just, it's hard to describe, but that's kind of what he ended up doing. That that's that's my impression of it, and uh, and he he freed up drummers in a way to you don't have to play hi hat on two and four. You know him and Elvin. Elvin also was Elvin Jones was 
uh, those two guys really changed everything for drummers. And um, I still, I, you know, I listen to that stuff, and I, I, it just it's so inspirational because of the way they're they're uh, playing around what is going on. You know, it's uh, you know, it's like the discovery of uh, the theory of relativity or something. <laughs> <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> no, I, d- I mean it's this is so important though, man, because. There, I mean, I talked to, I just interviewed Reggie Workman a couple months ago, and uh, you know, and he just said he goes, I, he goes, I can go see a smoke, he goes, I can go see a forty-five minute set, you know, some jazzers or you know, maybe they're playing straight ahead, I don't know, but he's talking about going to see a set, and um, he said the drummer's got huge technical chops, but he doesn't use the cymbals once in the forty-five mm-hmm. minutes. And there's something about playing around the tune in this impression impressionistic way that to my ear, it just, it, it is somehow it is, we need cats like Chamberlain to carry the lineage forward, man. I just, do you feel like the symbol, I even Joe Sample, I talked to Sample was like, I just don't see younger cats using the symbols. And uh, yeah. I wanted you to talk about that because I mean, the colors of that, um, but also getting back to you and Haas, I mean, talking about talk about how you guys break the, up the time and then go back into time. Well, I mean, there's there's ways of doing it where, you know, thanks to Tony and Tony Williams and Elvin and you know, like and even like you know the more contemporary guys like Joey Barron and um, Paul Motion and you know, it, it's the time is there. You can stop playing the time. I can play like a uh, like a little melodic bass line kind of thing on my toms and interject between what what Brian's doing. You know, there's a lot of ways, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I guess you call them systems of improv, you know, where you, you know, there's a call and response and there's then just, you know, free time. There's, I mean, there's, you know, the drum kit is just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a contraption, man. It's like just a collection of sounds. So, you know, what, what I've been doing is just adding other noises to it to try to take it into uh, uh, like almost like sound design, you know, like I have contact mics on some stuff, uh, which I was inspired by Chris Cutler, by, you know, Chris Cutler, the guy from the art bears, the English drummer. Sure. Yeah. He, he, he did this whole, I think he still does it, this whole electrified drum kit where he's just, he's treating the drum kit like an electric guitar, you know, running it through pedals. And so it's fun to go from, you know, acoustic drums to just all of a sudden I'm like, hitting this spring with a contact mic on it going into this reverb pedal, you know, and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, and, uh, it's like what guitar players get to do, you know, an electric guitar player gets to play, you know, they can play a nice clean tone, but then they can pop a pedal on and all of a sudden you're, you know, in psychedelic land, you know, it's, uh, I don't, I don't think the drum kids made the evolution from, uh, 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 an acoustic instrument to an electrified instrument. It's either, acoustic or completely electronic you know it's never been electrified in in a successful way or uh, in a way that you know there's there's only been a few people i know that have done it and it's it's one of the things i i'm really interested in doing with brian that's that's kind of the other part of it besides just the concepts of, of imp- improvisation is just uh being able to take these sounds that you would only get in the studio because you can sit there and tweak forever but get these sounds and do them live in an improvisational way, you know, um, like making loops and then dubbing them out and then having all these sound sources that might inspire some new situation with the music. Um, mm. It's fun. It's fun as a drummer to do that. It turns me into like a percussionist or a, a sound design guy or something, you know. It's, it takes me out of the, the usual vocabulary. Well, I, I mean, do you think that this is something you're already? I, I assume you're, you're. This is sort of a. Um, uh, you're, you're you're testing this stuff out right now. You're you're working on this live right now. Yeah, it's just a big science project. That's what I'm saying. So <laughs> I want to talk about talk about the. I mean, I, I don't know. If fearlessness is the right word. I just know that you got to be willing to 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 fall down and 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 maybe it doesn't sound so great for but until you really figure it out. I mean, you're 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 working things out on the bandstand, which I think is really important. And um and you know, cuz eventually that's do you find that I mean, essentially 
is there anybody doing anything close to what you are talking about uh you know currently in 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 the in the live touring circuit i'm not aware i mean i know a lot of drummers will trigger pre-recorded loops you know off of a laptop or something like that but um creating a loop in the moment from either an electronic source or just a mic'd up um, drum kit. I don't know anybody doing that in a improvisational setting. I just don't know. Uh, I'm not aware of it. Um, there, there are a lot of drummers that are out there playing acoustic drums with, uh, you know, cymbals and drums that are tuned like electronic instruments. Like, you know, Chris Daddy Dave, um, this drummer who's, I mean, he is, he sounds like, you know, he sounds like a drum machine or like a sample. He, he sounds like samples. Like he tunes his drums and he gets cymbals that sound almost electronic. And it's, it's from the hip hop thing. You know, mm-hmm. he comes from, you know, he plays on those D'Angelo records and, um, you know, it's kind of, you know, that's the aesthetic is to make your drum sound like that you know and that's a whole other universe that drummers are being inspired by is the whole uh you know i think it uh, you know that kind of lopsided feel thing that jay dilla that hip-hop producer was doing where it's not perfect time it's kind of like drunken time where the (laughs) snare beats are like you know i'm sure you've heard that stuff man it's like the snare beats are so behind the the hi-hat and like things are are disconnected and a lot of these younger drummers that are growing up can play like that naturally you know like you know it took me forever just to play with all my limbs together now these guys are like deconstructing it and consciously making the snare drum late <laughs> you know consistently like they're holding that space and it's it's a whole new way of playing drums and it comes from uh hip hop you know, from Jay Dilla and D'Angelo and all those records that they grew up on. So, um, do you think? I mean, so yeah, I, are, I, you have to ex- excuse my naivety, but I mean, as far as like those cats, like like Dilla and D'Angelo, did, were those uh-huh. human beings playing the drum kit, or were those electron? Like, was that a drum tr- machine that they had sound? Like, and now you got cats are able to do that in a humanistic way. I think that was uh, Questlove. Oh, okay. Well, that guy, that. that guy's got serious chops. I mean, that dude's a badass. Yeah. 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 So it's open and, and there's it? something yeah. I, there, there's something I saw of him on YouTube where he, he discusses all that. He talks about the evolution of being able to play like that during that time of, uh, there was a, a D'Angelo record called Voodoo. And, uh, you know, at the time it was all about sounding like an MPC drum machine, you know, being perfect. And then, Jay Dilla showed up. He met Jay Dilla, and, and it was like it just blew his mind because he was looping things and making them sound kind of, you know, like they're not exactly swung, they're not exactly straight. You know, it goes back to, like, any kind of traditional music you can think of. Like, if you think of, like, Afro-Cuban music or African music, it's not straight time or swung. It's kind of in the middle. You know, that's what the blues is, too. Like, uh, you know, a lot of guitar players and early rock and roll and stuff some people are swinging, some people are straight. It's this it's this thing. It just keeps happening with humans. <laughs> I wonder if it's I wonder if it's built into our DNA to have this uh this thing going on, you know. Um, well, I mean, it's straight. cool to talk to you about this cuz I I'm sort of look with my daughters, I just so much of it I I uh I mean, for some reason that the the Elvin Tony talked about uh so many other guys they just seem to create so much space in the music and it's hard in 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 contemporary pop music to hear a lot of space within the drums and i just automatically assume that you know it's a drum machine that's that's doing it but to know that um the the lineage is continuing uh is incredibly invigorating um i just for i mean i guess can you talk about uh, the when you got to college or the first band where uh, you know, you you felt like your ears really grew the most um, because I it just aside from the Garibaldi and stuff. I mean, you you had you you moved on after that and went to college. Can you talk about that first band where your ears grew. Yeah, well, you know, up, up to that point, I hadn't really played in bands. I was just, you know, the dude in the practice room, just trying to figure out how to do all these exercises. You know, it was like a like patting your head and 
rubbing your stomach or something kind of exercises. So when I got <laughs> to college, it was more about playing with other musicians and and learning about uh, you know how to how to make things feel good. And uh, it took me a while. You know, I, I I didn't last in college too long because I discovered they were trying to turn me into a music teacher, and I was not down with being a music teacher at the time. So. Uh, <laughs> can you talk I, you know, like, I, I, like, like what is that can you explain what like they were making you conform and 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 be a potential how does how does that how does that look i'm very fascinated because i'm so convinced that these uh not that there are listen i mean i was talking to will blades over the on my show on the weekend and he was like talking about i'm like you know ron carter eddie henderson billy hart i mean these are all guys i you know i've interviewed i love these guys but it's like, you know, I mean, I get it that, that like, you know, they're at Juilliard and, you know, the, it's great faculty. But at the same time, it's like what I mean, how, talk about what you uh, recoiled against when they when you when you felt like it was they were turning you into a teacher. What does that look like? Well, I mean, in hindsight, I'm I'm really happy that, you know, it's a, it's a, it was more of a, uh, you know, uh, distilling things down to a program of study in order for them to get, you know, to be a music school, they have to do that. They have to make sure that you're taking tests and you're, you're absorbing some kind of curriculum. But um, I just thought it was a, a funny thing to have a jazz program at a college where you're teaching improvisation and have all these rules, you know, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's an oxymoron. You're, you're nailing you know, it. You're nailing Yeah, go ahead. Continue. Yeah, so so I noticed that when I was playing jazz in like these certain little uh, classes and situations, I was getting graded, and um, it just felt really stifling. I didn't feel very creative. And then I'd go have jam sessions with my buddies at their house, and I was like, man, this is the shit. This is what I want to be doing. <laughs> I want to be playing with people and exploring and, and feel free to do whatever the hell I want. I don't have to change to my hi-hat for the this section or do that you know it's about breaking the rules and trying things and you know when you're young you're kind of rebellious anyway so i just i was like man screw you guys i'm gonna i'm gonna just go start a band and start playing gigs and uh you know that's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of what i did it was kind of foolish you know because i had a nice situation there at the college you know i wish i would have learned more music theory and and all that business but as far as playing drums I, I i was obsessed with drums anyway so i was going to study my ass off even if i wasn't in college so and a lot of it had to do with just playing music with people that was my my school i just wanted to play with as many people as i could in as many situations as i could just to learn how it all works you know and i was in texas so you know there was like you know there's a lot of blues guys there's a lot of uh, a lot of funk and there was the whole Deep Ellum part of Dallas, which was just starting, which was a whole music scene that I was lucky enough to be at the beginning of. And, uh, you know, it was like this whole group of people that were around the same age. You know, we we're all like 20, 21 years old, and there were all these clubs to play at. And, uh, I mean, it, you know, it was just so much fun. You know, it was, uh, you know, it wasn't based on jazz, really, but it was based on doing whatever the hell you wanted to do. You know, it was like a, you know, there were artists there, uh, uh, you know, people in different forms of media, and, and not just music, but it all kind of was inspirational and made everybody just want to do something different, you know, like any kind of scene. And uh, that's kind of what, what I ended up doing. I mean, uh, college was a great way for me to uh, get there. <laughs> Well, you, you went and you went to the you went to you know one of the bastions of you know North Texas State's been around forever, but of course like Berkeley, I mean, you know, school of music. Those, I mean, those. I just know that that leaders came out of there and formed bands. Billy Harper came out of there, formed his bands, uh, North Texas State. Uh, but that that it's so there's very little of a touring circuit now, and then I don't know. I mean, again, it's like. Uh, there, I don't know how I, I, it's vexing to me how you're supposed to teach improvisation with all with rules. Um, I, I don't, um, but I, I think also it takes a lot of like, what does the deep Elm mean 
exactly? I mean, is it is it is it uh, you know like tree hogger music? What what is that? What does that mean? What was that scene like? Um, it was everything. You know, it was this was we're talking like eighty six, eighty seven, right. in Dallas. So there were like garage rock punk bands. Uh, there was a, a club called Theater Gallery that opened up that. I mean, I saw everybody there from, like, the Butthole Surfers to Jane's Addiction to Bad Brains to, uh, uh, you know, and, and it was insane. And then in Fort Worth at the same time, which was, like, you know, half-hour drive away, you had Caravan of Dreams, that jazz club. So you could go over there and see, like, Ronald Shannon Jackson and Ornette Coleman, and I saw just so much stuff. So during that time, I was able to just get – it was so overwhelming and inspiring to go see, you know – um, you know, like Ronald Shannon Jackson, like that's that guy was a monster, and he was pushing drumming, jazz free jazz drumming to like a whole new level. That and and you know I I'm surprised people don't talk about him more because he he's like one of my biggest influences in general because he took the energy of rock music and funk and freed it up into like almost like free jazz. It was I, that whole I, I missed the thing. name. Who 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 you who'd you say? Oh, uh, Ronald Shannon Jackson. Ron, okay, I didn't know he played traps though. For okay, he, yeah, so that dude was doing some serious. I think in the eighties things got. Uh, but you're saying he fused the he took rock and and funk and, and, and funk, and then he put and it, it became more free. Yeah, it became more like free time, and uh, his bands that he had. You know, he had like Vernon Reed when in his band when he was a young kid and Melvin Gibbs, you know, they were like 20 years old probably when they're playing with him. And those records are crazy sounding, but you know, all that stuff came out during that time in jazz when there was that whole uh, traditional Renaissance, you know, the whole young lions thing, the Wynton sure. Marcellus. Sure. So it wasn't, I don't think it got paid attention to enough. And, um, but it, man, that's like a whole other, thing that it changed changed my mind about how to play uh you know jazz and funk and be contemporary in a way you know it wasn't a throwback thing it was kind of modern you know, it was looking forward i want to um, uh yeah i want to i want to um yeah. i know you're 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 on the mend right now i want to put in a piece of music here uh and uh just have you listen to it and and then we'll come back and break it down okay Okay. The Circle Tree Ranch, the Stereo Hospital, and Abbott Taylor Jewelers, and we thank them for their support. All right, Chamberlain, what do you got for us, brother? Oh, man. I don't know. What What do you need? Well, no, <laughs> what, what, what's, the, what's, the name of that, what's the name of that tune, brother, man? Oh, what's that one called? It's called Space Colonization. Yeah. Space colonization. See, I, we just played it. Brian named them. I, I don't remember. Well, I mean, we, I mean, we, I want to talk to you very serious. Okay, so like, I love. Uh, you guys are stretching sonically and stretching consciousness. And there's one here, orange, purple, sunshine. Um, uh -huh. I'm just curious. Can you talk about um, with you and Haas? I mean, Haas can speak for himself when I get it, get a hold of him. But can you talk about? I mean, you were already on the bandstand uh and really exposing yourself to you know just getting into as many different musical settings as possible seeing as much live music as possible then ultimately you're creating this um now you're you're in this thing where you're doing all sorts of stream of consciousness abstraction really really cool quasi you know partially electronic and partially human music and but I just wanted to ask you about your use of psychedelics and how that has helped you expand your, uh, whether it's freed you from time and uh, just how it's helped you creatively, if at all. Right. Well, it's been quite a while since I've had a good psychedelic experience. <laughs> me too. Yeah, me too. I mean, uh, God, like back in the 90s, like early 90s, I remember when I was in my early 20s, was experimenting with, you know, psilocybin, reading the Terrence McKenna books, you sure, know, <laughs> sure, sure. Oh, the whole thing, yeah, that whole thing, and 
that, you know, I never really, I never got a hold of anything else really. It was just, it was either uh, you know, like mushrooms or uh, smoking some weed here and there. But the the fun thing to do with that was just to play music with people, you know, and uh, and record it and listen back to it. You know, maybe something would come of it. Uh, generally, it wouldn't be so great. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about one? I really because you're. I, I I appreciate your honesty. Can you talk about playing when you were tripping out and maybe something that even was positive? Maybe it didn't sound that great, but you took away something from it. Yeah. Well, you know, the the end result was always kind of. Eh, you know, it wasn't that special. You know, it was really special to me in my head at the time right. because <laughs> I was tripping my brains out, and um, and I could close my eyes, and you know, I'm floating through outer space playing my ride cymbal, and that's always fun. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think I think the one thing I took away from it is that um, there's a lot of possibilities while you're playing music. You know, you can you can uh, choose a lot of different things while you're playing. You're, you don't have to do anything in particular, you know, especially when you're in, a, in an improvisational setting. And the more, uh, the, the more options you have under your belt as far as uh, learning about different genres of music, the more, the more places you can go. And, um, you know, when I was during that time, I was in this band uh, with E.G. Brickell and the New Bohemians, and we had a rehearsal space. And, you know, that was a pop band, and but but the guys in the band were really into just playing all the time. So, you know, we'd, we'd do that. You know, we'd take mushrooms, and we'd just play for hours and hours and record it and and try to learn something from it and uh, see if we come up with some different way of approaching playing pop music or, or writing songs or just playing like okay I, you know, I came with this pattern I came up with this chord progression I don't know it's just it's one of those things where you know doing doing psychedelics has has given people a lot of insight you know it's always educational but it might not be educational in as an end result thing it's more like research and development <laughs> <laughs> R&D so like it's R&D yeah it's R&D I can, love you, it you dude. can take what you learned you can take what you learned and then distill it down into something more concrete. Although there are bands, you know, there are bands that have made whole careers out of just R and D, you know, like, uh, the grateful dead. <laughs> yeah, but even the, those cats, I'm so curious, you know, to talk to like, I mean, when they really stopped taking acid, I mean, the acid test set aside. I mean, you hear sometimes like, Oh, maybe this show Phil took a hit of acid, but they didn't do it forever. I mean, they just couldn't constitutionally handle it forever. But I think yeah. it was going on. You're right. It was an R and D experiment. I mean, can you, knowing that, um, uh, can you talk about the what you are still, what is a what is still a challenge to to Matt Chamberlain in this? I know you're still growing and still learning, but I mean, it, it, either it's a can you talk about a challenge that you still are trying to attack and, and work on in your in your career at this point. Yeah, well, right now I'm writing a lot of music, so I'm trying to learn more of that. You know, it's just stuff I would have learned in college if I stayed in college, but just more, you know, harmonic structure, melodic stuff. Uh, and then as far as drumming goes and improv, just getting out of the usual stuff, you know, just trying to change it up. That's That's the one thing this week we noticed is, you know, we just played six gigs in a row, and it's all improvisational, and we and we realize we fall into patterns. And um, how do you break that up and do something different? You know, I mean, obviously you are who you are, and you gravitate towards certain things. But uh, you know, how can like what are some some devices we can come up with some musical devices to like take us out of the usual uh, thing? You know, um, that to me is exciting. Just different ways of thinking about playing um that's that's what i'm working on a lot right now just trying to approach it from a different angle because there's so much that's been done already and there's you know it's great to study what's been done but when it comes right down to it you're left with yourself and uh and what you do so you know I'm, i can't play like anybody else i can try to play like tony or or elvin 
And it's nice to think of them sometimes when you're playing and go, wow, what would they do in this situation? You know, uh, but um, that's, that's kind of what I'm working on, just different ways to think about improv and then just trying to write you know, music and play it so that I can, you know, um, express what's going on besides just playing drums. No, it's interesting. I mean, it's sort of what you were alluding to earlier about doing, like, electronic loops on the fly, like in the real time. But uh, I'm just curious about, do you ever do any tunes? Even Tony uh, did some really weird stuff with Ben Sidron in the early 70s, like the Bums Rush, and there were vocals mm -hmm. on it, and, you know, Ego. Do you get off on Ego? Like that, uh, not Lifetime, but, uh, yeah, like the, the later Lifetime, like the early 70s stuff uh, with Larry Young and Ted Dunbar. Uh, I think it's called Ego. I mean, it's very, there's like also, do you, do you, yeah. do you use vocals? Vo uh, do you use any vocal no. uh, type stuff? I, I wouldn't do any vocals myself personally. I mean, I, I would love to get together with the great singer and do it, but I'm not even going to attempt to <laughs> venture into that. <laughs> uh, man, I, I could, you know, I'm just, I'm just playing some drums and trying to write some songs, but yeah. Um, nah, no, no vocals for me unless it, it, it involves comedy. <laughs> well, no. And speaking of comedy, I mean, yeah. I just want you to break down, like, Steve Martin. I mean, that dude has some chops, right? And he's a pretty good banjo player. Yeah. He's really serious. Yeah. I mean, I mean did, did you... For real. You played blue... So, I mean, the thing is that it's all music. I mean, you you were playing bluegrass gigs with Steve Martin, which is just sick. I was? Well, I mean, it says here... It says it says uh, you were backing up artists like Muscle White, Johnny Winter, and then it goes... Oh, work, work. that was in SNL. Yeah, when I was in that house band with with Saturday Night Live house band, they had different guests, and we would back up, you know, for different comedy skits and stuff. Um, the one with Steve Martin at the time was just like this funny song and dance thing that he did for his monologue. It was funny, right? So it, it wasn't him <laughs> on the, it wasn't him plucking the banjo or anything like that. No, no. It's funny though because he's playing. He has a thing with Edie Brickell now. They do this whole bluegrass thing, which is really great. I mean, I think they won like a Grammy or something for it. Right. It's, it's, it's actually really good. He's, he's a, he's a, a for real banjo player. Let me ask you, um, about, uh, how, how do you believe that you, how did you learn to play a good shuffle? Oh God, I don't even think I've ever played a good shuffle. Yeah. I mean, I've tried. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't it's had hard, the opportunity man. to play. Man, I haven't had the oppor that many opportunities to play a shuffle. Um, you know, I'm not the first guy they'd call to play shuffle, but, I, you know, I've listened to quite a bit of music that has shuffles, and I think it's incredible. Um, I don't know. I'd, I'd give it a go. Somebody wanted me to play a shuffle. I'd see, I'd see if I could do it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's not in my bag of tricks that naturally just flows out of me. I don't just break into a shuffle because I'm feeling it. You know, it's a... Uh, you know, there's different, you know, of course, there's different types of shuffles, right? There's the Texas shuffle, there's the there's a lot of different shuffles. You're 100% right about walkers. it. It's just the shuffle to me, the sh playing a shuffle beat, being able to play a shuffle beat. When I talk to Jabo Starks, Clyde Stubblefield, those cats, I mean, that they really, they, 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 they put that stuff, they put it down. And uh, it, it seems like it's... Maybe just from listening to those old blues records or Fats Domino's records, I just I just like to talk to, to cats. Even if you haven't had a, an opportunity to play it, you know that there's a challenge to it. And I always like, oh to, man, you know, I mean, yeah, like those, uh, like all that stuff Earl Palmer did with like uh, exactly. Little Richard, and I mean, Jesus, that's like it's incredible. And then all the stuff with like uh, like Howlin' Wolf, and uh, I'm not sure who played drums on the Howlin' Wolf stuff, but. Or, 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 uh, he played with Alan Toussaint, I think, too, a little bit, maybe. Uh, Earl Palmer did. Earl Palmer, yeah. And yeah. he, you know, he moved to LA in the late 60s, early 70s and became a huge session musician. Oh, the, I mean, the, I really mean, the, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I rest in peace because I, I mean, I've gotten to Hal yeah. Blaine and, you know, Keltner and I speak. On, do you, have you met Keltner before? He's a good friend. Dude, yeah, I love Keltner. He's, I consider Keltner a very good. Talk about Jim Keltner because that dude, we've done two cosmic interviews. I got to get your email so I can send you some of this stuff because you're going to love this, these interviews. But um, how did you meet Keltner and, and talk about your friendship with Keltner? 
Um, I met Keltner on a Brad Meldow record called Largo. Um, the producer was John Bryan, and he had both of us play drums on it. And so I was setting my drums up next to him, and I met him. And he was just so sweet and nice and uh, just, man, just such a amazing musician and human. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we played on this record together, and uh, I felt, you know, I talk about this a lot with my friends. I'm like, there's this thing called the Jim Keltner effect. Where if you what? hang out with him, or if you know if you hang out with him, or if you play music with him, you feel like you're a better musician for like a day after it's over, and then it just wears off really fast. But you feel like, oh yeah, I got my shit together finally. And then you know a day later, you're like, shit, not anymore. I need to go hang out with Jim. <laughs> it's funny that I mean that that is it just yeah. because you, you it's a a gravitas thing or is it genuinely like some sort of like you know some sort of like fungus that just hangs there <laughs> no he's he's like uh he's he really is like a shaman or something man that guy yeah he, there's something there's he, a mystical had... quality about it. i i completely i mean i've never met him in person but we've done two hour long radio interviews and yeah i, I don't know i i can't quite put my finger on it uh shaman i haven't yeah, i've had you know, Go ahead. I had an experience with him where he came in to a session I was doing. It was after we met, obviously, and uh, we we're we we're talking. And he's like, "Oh man, let me check out these drums." And so he sat down on my kit and he played them. And when he played them, like an extra low octave came out of the drums somehow. Like he made them sound huge. And then I sat down at them, and they were like, "Boing, boing, 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 boing." <laughs> you know, it, it right, have, right, right, right. I don't know. I was like, what the, he's like Yoda or something. I don't know what, what he was doing, but that, I mean, there've been many experiences like that with him where you don't know what he's doing, but it's some, it's something's going on and it's, it's insane. I mean, it's just so deep and it's not a technical thing. It's more of a, uh, like the way of saying something, you know, like the weight behind it, not the, technical part it's more of like when he just lays down a groove man like you know the, there's like the the uh time space continuum opens up and and you can see you know the the, the history of the universe <laughs> or something well, no, the, i mean the sound that he even the cat's going back to like danny Korchmar, like you know first time they ever connected like you know just i mean he, the sound that he got I just wanted to ask you about playing double drums. I mean, that was, was it like a, that Meldau record? Was, I mean, it's obviously not Mad Dogs and Englishmen, you know, stuff. But um, I'm fascinated with double drums. I was just talking, I mean, there's a eye doctor out in kind of, you know, in the valley out there in Southern California. Robbie Krieger, Kenny Gradney, and Keltner all go to this cat. And then this guy has his own radio show, Finefield mm -hmm. is his name. And they uh, there he is uh, playing double drums with... Uh, I'll have to look up the cat's name, but, uh, you know, it's just, can you talk about playing, not just with Keltner, but how, how best, because I think, you know, the consistent cyclical rhythms are, are vital and you, yeah. you can get into that double drum. Uh, and sometimes I don't think people know how to do it. How, how do you, how do you best navigate work with that in the double drum setting? Well, it's, you know, it's not something that a lot of drummers do and it's not something I've done a lot of, but. You know, for instance, when I first met Keltner, um, one of the first things I asked him was, you know, hey, you, you do this double drum thing a lot. Do you like doing this? And he he said, no, because you get two good drummers together, and each drummer thinks they have to play half of what they usually play to accommodate the other guy, and so you get, like, two half drummers <laughs> playing, and they're not, and it doesn't add up to, like, one good drummer. So... I think the best situations with two drummers are when they're both just playing, you know, just going, going off. And, uh, but it's tricky because you know, a lot of train wrecks could happen and you're playing generally the same instruments. You know, you have, you have snare drums and kicks and hi-hats. And so, uh, you know, Kelton, he kind of, 
the, the way he likes to do it is he just creates these weird drum kits out of out of uh, just odd sounding drums so that he doesn't sound anything like the guy playing the normal drum kit. So he end, he ends up sounding almost like the percussionist playing around the drummer when he <laughs> yeah. creates that stuff. So he's unbelievable. Um, I mean, he's been doing that with I don't know. Do you ever hear those John Clemmer records with uh, him and him and uh, Shelly Mann on them? From like the seventies. Yeah. Since I don't even know. Yeah, that, that he's just he's just doing so one cat really sort of ultimately needs to be a color guy and the other guy's kind of holding down keeping time. Is that is that kind of yeah. is that fair? Or, well, I mean it seems to work a lot of different ways. I mean, you know, the the just two drummers just going off works really well too. You know, but like when you listen to like the Allman brothers do it, there was one guy who had like the little jazz bebop kit tuned like a jazz drummer. And then there was the other guy who had the drum kit tuned low and dead like a rock drummer. So it was two different sounds that complemented each other. Um, you know, so well, you that know, worked that's really that well. Jame, Jame was the jazzer and I interviewed Butch Trucks yeah. last week and he, he was the, he was the rock guy. So it worked, you know? It's just I yeah 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 it's awesome that I love that you and Keltner collaborated because that guy yeah shaman I don't know but there's something there's something magical and mystical about uh, those cats and maybe it's just they all were you know coming up during that amazing period of time I just I'd like you to talk about before I let you go here Chamberlain we've been cooking for about a little bit over an hour here but uh, just wanted you to talk a little bit about. Um, your contribution, how you mentor younger cats today, not that you're a gray beard by any means, but um, Mm -hmm. could you talk about how you are trying to, I mean, ultimately I'm doing my show into the tune of five to six interviews a week. And with, you know, everyone from bluegrass to, you know, to, to Afro, Afro jazz. And, and, and I just, I'm just trying to keep that link and be a link in the chain. But I, you know, as a drummer, somebody who's you know, pretty articulate, someone who clearly didn't even know what they were doing but sought out someone like Garibaldi at 14. You know, what are you doing as a mentor today? How do you mentor in the 21st century uh, on the drum kit or, you know, whatever, in the, you know, verbally, orally? Right. Well, man, I, you know, whenever I meet young guys that ask me how to do, you know, how to be this or that or do this or that and you know where should i live to do this or that or um i just i just break it down for them and say listen you're living in a time where you have youtube you can go online and listen to any kind of music you know i had to like you know if i wanted like an afro-cuban record back in you know the 80s it was a it was a chore to find anything you know you, you know you heard about like a record store in the subway in new york city that sold Afro-Cuban records. So if you went to New York City, you had to buy a bunch of these records and check it out. So if you're a young drummer now, you can get on YouTube and listen to anything. You can listen to like Gamelon music, uh, any kind of Afro-Cuban music, bata drumming, uh, any jazz record. I mean, it's just all there. So you can, you can be a sponge and absorb it all. But still, you got to say something. You know, you got to eventually come up with your own style and... Uh, just, I just tell them to stay as open-minded as possible. You know, a lot of it's just cliche stuff, I guess. You know, stay open-minded. Don't be a cynical jerk, you know. there's Playing music is a privilege, and you should, you should uh, realize that, you know, re- re- realize that it's, it's really a special situation. If you can do it for a living, it's, you're a lucky person. And getting there, there's no one way to get there. It's, uh, you know, so many people do it in so many ways you know so many ways to get there so i just, i i think just staying open minded and not being cynical you know cynicism really kills a lot of great musicians man and for good reason there's a lot of you still there you yeah, know i'm just, i'm really i'm i'm ready to counter you oh. but i want you to continue on the cynicism thing why why do people get oh. cyn- cynical well you know um uh weird business dealings sure uh, you know, the, the music industry is just horrible to musicians. You know, it, it always has been. And, uh, you know, if you're playing clubs, club owners can try to rip you off. And after a while, you could start feeling like, oh, man, right, you know, being being a musician is kind of, 
not all it's cracked up to be, but it really is. You know, you just got to get your get your business stuff together so you don't get screwed over. And, you know, even if you do get your business stuff together, chances are you probably will get screwed over. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I mean, it doesn't matter what really what industry you're probably going to get screwed over yeah. no matter what. But the 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 I mean, don't you think that the saturation of material on YouTube? I mean, do you, would you do you ever advise people to go seek out? Uh, seek stuff out and get off the internet because I think there's a, such a deluge of information today that people don't even know where to start. If you ever asked, yeah, well, to, of course, I mean, of you, course, man, going out to see somebody play yeah. is the biggest education you can get. But I, I was just speaking to the kid that's like in some small town. That's you know asking me like, how do you, how do you do this thing, you know? But if you if you happen to be somewhere to go see somebody, man, for sure. Because that's like the biggest deal, just seeing how they move. You know, if you're a drummer and you see, you go out and see somebody play, besides the fact that they sound incredible, just seeing how they move is like a really big education. Just the way they use their, their body is a big, a big uh, thing, you know. Every, Everybody is different, and you can take some of that and apply it. Um, yeah, the, the Internet <laughs> could be a problem. Well, it is a problem for a lot of people. But, um, yeah. Or just collect, just collect. Still, you, there's still plenty. You can still get the vinyl, and you still collect the vinyl, and uh, or at least for me, yeah. that, that's that's essential. But um, you know, Matt Chamberlain, it, it was really, a, I really enjoyed uh, hanging with you. I hope you and Haas can get down to the Tucson. I mean, there's, you know, we, we always get neglected here, um, but I really think that your your music would. There's a couple of clubs here that would would work really well, and it would be uh, be great to see you in person. Cool. Well, thanks. Yeah. Well. We'll see how this next little run goes, and if we can make it happen, then we'll get out there. Yeah, man. Tell, tell Haas I'm looking for him, all right? Okay, I'll right. tell him. Much love, dude. <laughs> Keep swinging, man. All right, thanks a lot. All right, cheers. All right, man, thanks. Yeah, later. Bye. Bye-bye. Just heard from a prolific drummer, Matt Chamberlain, him and Brian Haas, and their new album, Prometheus Risen, in stores, online, available now. Uh, just another day at the office, just another whistle stop. We're going to rejoin the Jim Parisi show. This is the Jake Feinberg show. A bevy of interviews this week coming up. We'll be back tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday. Peace. And so I say, oh, wow, I'm surprised he went there, but he does. And I'm going to give you a couple of minutes.